On this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, the military and others target Hawaii fuel. I'm your host, Sal McCoglano. Welcome to What's Going On With Shipping. I'm your host. If you have not done so yet, please subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos when they come out. So just had a report come out this past day about the Department of Defense's decision to shut the Red Hill fueling facility in Hawaii. Let's go ahead and take a look at the story. This is a story on G-Captain John Conrad, U.S. Navy to shut down world's largest underground bunker fuel tanks. Uh, Secretary of Defense uh, Lloyd J. Austin announced the closure of the Red Hill Fuel Storage Depot in Hawaii, which is the world's largest underground fuel and ship bunker storage facility. Unlike any other facility in the United States, Red Hill can store up to 250 million gallons of fuel. It consists of 20 steel-lined underground storage tanks encased in concrete and built into cavities that were mined inside of Red Hill. Each tank has a capacity of approximately 12.5 million gallons. Before the entry of the United States into World War II, Franklin Roosevelt became concerned about the vulnerability of the many above ground fuel storage tanks. In 1940, it was decided to build a new underground facility. So this is the famous issue that comes out of the attack on Pearl Harbor. This is the above ground tanks that a lot of people will talk about being targeted during the attack on Pearl Harbor. If there was a third wave of the Japanese attack on December 7th, 1941, they were going to target these tanks right here. Now, I should note a couple of things. Number one, a lot of people talk about this, but let's be clear about a couple of things. Notice the revetments around these tanks. All these tanks have these barriers around them so that if they're punctured, if they break open, the oil is contained in those areas. They don't spill out of control. Second, very hard to light these things on fire. This is heavy oil. This is bunker oil. This is a really heavy, viscous oil. It's not gasoline. It's not diesel fuel. Uh, so yeah, you can hit them with a direct hit, light them on fire. But again, that fire would probably be constrained. You would need to hit literally nearly all these tanks to burst them into flames. It would take a coordinated attack on these to, to knock these out. Regardless, the U.S. has finally announced that they're shutting down the Red Hill facility. Now, let me be 100% clear and on one thing. They should. They are criminal that they haven't shut this thing down sooner. The issue here is that fuel oil has been leaking into the aquifer, into the water source, and polluting. People on base in Hawaii can light their water on fire. This has been a systemic problem that should have been handled by the DOD a lot sooner. Why it hasn't, again, I don't know. I live in North Carolina near Camp Lejeune or Camp Lejeune, depending on how you pronounce it. And one of the issues right there has been contaminated water. Why DOD, the Department of Defense, doesn't deal with this sooner, I don't know. But the issue I want to address with is the shutting down of this fuel facility and the fact that there is not really a plan in place to deal with this going forward. This is the statement by Lloyd Austin. And let me go ahead and change my viewpoint here so you can see the full thing. Uh, he talks about this. This is a multi-step process. Through the process, we will work closely with the Hawaii Department of Health and the EPA safely to fuel the facility no later than May 31st. So we're only talking a few months away. Secretary of Navy and Department of Defense, uh, Defense Logistics Agency will provide an action plan for safe and expeditious defueling of the facility with a completion target of 12 months. Then as soon as we've made corrective actions to ensure that defueling will be safe, we will begin defueling. Then we will move to permanently close the facility, including conducting any and all necessary environmental remediation around the facility. Okay, so they're going to shut this thing down. This is a huge, massive fuel facility. Understand, this is a storage site for a massive amount of fuel. The United States Navy, which is forward deployed in Hawaii in the Western Pacific, counts on this fueling point to provide them with needed replenishment. U.S. Navy oilers operated by the Military Seal of Command come into Hawaii to fuel. Ships come into Hawaii to refuel directly. This is essential for our Pacific strategy in a potential peer-to-peer -peer conflict against China. They then make this statement. Uh, centrally located fuel storage of this magnitude likely made sense in 1943 when it was built. Again, the Central Pacific Drive was key on this. I just gave a talk to the Naval Expeditionary Warfare Conference where I talked about World War II expeditionary logistics, particularly fuel, and I talked about how constrained we were in 1942 
based on this, I'll matter of fact be taking that presentation and putting it online shortly so everybody can see it. Statement goes on. And Red Hill has served our armed forces well for many de decades, but it makes a lot less sense now. The distributed and dynamic nature of our force posture in the Indo-Pacific, the sophisticated threats we face and the technology available to us demand an equally advanced and resilient fueling capability. To a large degree, we already avail ourselves of dispersed fueling at sea and ashore, permanent and rotational. We will now expand and accelerate that strategic distribution. Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. What does that mean? I, I, I mean, seriously, Department of Defense, I know you love your catchwords. I know you love taking those key words, distributed, lethality, flexibility, stick them into a word blender, shake them up, and then spit them out in press briefings. But what in the wide, wide world of sports does that mean? Seriously. I, I don't think you know what it means. I don't know how with a straight face you say that statement and put it out there and think, number one, any normal human being understands what the foxtrot you just said. And second of all, there's no plan there. I, I mean, you're using words to hide the fact that you are removing vital fuel that's in war plans from the Central Pacific with no plan to fix it right now. You are just spitballing this. And you're hoping under the fog screen of that statement, and by the way, it just kudos, whichever public affairs officer wrote that, congratulations. That is a word soup of epic proportions. But what does it mean? Because let's take a look at what is out there and what we're talking about by removing the Red Hill facility. So this is the fact sheet that was attached to Secretary of Defense Austin's statement. To advance the goals set forth in Indo-PACOM, which is the Ind India, Indian Ocean Pacific Command, that's the old Pacific uh, Command, long-term plan for strategic fuel storage in the Pacific, the Department of Defense will reposition stored at Red Hill by leveraging commercial infrastructure. Okay, so you're going to find commercial tanks or commercial vessels to stick this into is basically what you're saying. You're going to take 20, mil 20 million gallons of fuel and stick them in commercial vessels. The Department of Defense will ensure that relocated fuel will be stored according to all applicable environmental regulations. Well, kudos, you hadn't done that yet. So great, you're doing it now. Afloat storage vessels will be US flagged and crewed and will be operating in accordance with the US Coast Guard safety environmental standards. Okay, you're going to use US flag tankers then to basically hold this oil. Okay, time out. Let's go to the most recent Military Sealift Command annual report. This is it. This is the Military Sealift Command annual report for 2021. They issue these every year. They've been doing it since 1959. And let me be clear, since 1959, they've gotten prettier, more colorful, great pictures with less detail in them. I don't know why you guys hide information and don't want to put them out here, but you are absolutely denuding statistics and information. You hide it under a, a glossy press release. I'm the only one who's probably ever read all those things, but I'm telling you, they're terrible. This is what they say here. In FY21, which is fiscal year, MSC transported 24.1 million barrels. That's 1.2 billion gallons, 1.2 billion gallons. Again, come back here to what Red Hills is, 250 million gallons. So basically, MSC has transported four times the capacity of Red Hill in the last year. Uh, it's over 190 voyages in support of the De Department of Logistics Agency's energy office. U.S. flag tankers carried 19 million of the 24.1 million, or 79.3%. So the U.S. military contracted out 20.7% of the carriage of fuel for the Department of Defense to foreign vessels. Uh, that is a major issue, I think. One out of five, one fifth is carried in foreign vessels. The US has basically, the DOD has gotten away from maintaining and long-term chartering ships. They talk about here that there are only five long-term chartered vessels uh, in the military seal of command fleet, medium range tankers, the MT Empire State, the MT Evergreen State, these are the motor tankers, uh, the Maersk Perry, the SNLC Goodwill, and the SLNC PAX. And then they charter other vessels, shallower draft, 
to do some other specific cargo. Five tankers. And of those five tankers, three are large, two are small. In 1949, when MSTS, the Military Sea Transportation Service, was created, it consisted of 55 large tankers and two small tankers. Today, it consists of three tankers and two small tankers. In 1990, the uh, Military Seal Command on the eve of the Persian Gulf War, at the end of the Cold War, had a fleet of about 25 tankers. Uh, five of them T-5 tankers under long-term charter and nine sea lift tankers under long-term charter with some other vessels added in there. We have systematically decreased the amount of tankers available. These are not the vessels that provide direct fueling to Navy vessels. These are the vessels that move fuel from the United States to DLA, Defense Logistics Agency bases around the world. And understand, these shipments have been identified as being well below what we need. Uh, right here, this study that was done by the Center for uh, Strategic and Budgetary Analysis, Sustaining the Fight, Resilient Maritime Logistics for a New Era, a uh, new era, not error, era, uh, identifies the fact that we are woefully, woefully below the level of commercial tankers we need. And in many ways, the CSBA have done multiple studies where they show that the amount of tankers available commercially, U.S. commercial tankers, is well below the threshold needed for military planning. Now, all of this, all of this takes place in the backdrop of a systematic attack that's taking place right now on U.S. flag tankers in the United States Merchant Marine. So literally at the same time, you're closing Red Hill and the Department of Defense is saying, we're going to get U.S. flag tankers to come in and store fuel and reposition fuel around into commercial facilities. And we're going to use this distributed lethality concept here to move fuel around. Representative Case of Hawaii is asking President Biden to waive the Jones Act to ship Hawaii oil, because what's going on right now is the sanctioning of Russian oil. And lo and behold, we just realized today, I guess we, nobody took a look at this for a long time, but we import Russian oil because our oil refineries, which we haven't built a new one since 1977, can't handle the fracking oil we're pulling out of the United States. We are literally awash in oil. We have more oil than we know what to do with. I know people sit there and say, you're looking at the gas prices go up, but understand we have more oil than we could ever consume. The problem here is we don't have the refinery capacity. We're literally shipping oil out of the United States to refine into gasoline and then shipping that oil back as gasoline. Or better yet, we are shipping in crude oil of high sulfur content because that's what our refineries can handle. And that is why we're buying Russian oil. And now you have Representative Case right here asking for a waiver to waive the Jones Act, and let me be clear, Representative Case is not the only one doing this. There's a whole concentrated effort doing this, including the oil companies who are asking for this. Now, understand, we have a finite number of oil tankers in the Jones Act fleet. This is the October 14th, 2021 report by the U.S. Maritime Administration on U.S. flag privately owned merchant vessels over 1,000 gross tons uh, right now, the merchant fleet is small, 180 vessels, but I weeded out all other vessels and I just have tankers on here. And so what we're looking at is roughly about 69 tankers uh, available, excuse me, not 69, I think I highlighted here, 65 tankers that are in the U.S. fleet that are available and in service right now to move fuel um, between the United States. The Jones Act requires that if you move cargo within the interior of the United States, continental United States or Alaska, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico, it has to be carried on a US owned, US flagged, US crewed, and US built sh ship. There are tankers out there right now sitting there waiting. I just did the list, just looked them up, and I found tankers that are in layup right now. The tanker market was depressed prior to Russia Ukraine war. So there are American tankers out there available to move cargo to the uh, island of Hawaii. Understand, Russian oil come, came into Hawaii on foreign tankers because those that tanker was coming from overseas. Now you have to move oil out of the United States to Hawaii 
to be refined and understand there are West Coast tankers sitting there ready to go. There are tankers on the Gulf Coast that could be repositioned through the Panama Canal that can go. So literally at the same time, in, in, in the midst of you have a confluent of events that are happening here at the same exact time, you shut the Red Hill facility which is going to now force you to take that fuel out, load them into commercial assets or onto US vessels of some kind, pre-position them uh, around the site, uh, basically tying up US flag vessels to do that. And at the same time, because of the sanctions against Russian oil, which just went into effect, you now have to replace that Russian crew that was going into Hawaiian refineries to refine it. And that means what, Representative Case and many others are doing, including paid lobbyists, are advocating that we waive the Jones Act right now, get rid of that requirement so that we can get foreign ships to come in. Understand the whole purpose of the Jones Act in 1920 was because, and, and I have a video right here that you can watch that explains this whole thing. The whole reason we passed this act in 1920 is because we were overly dependent on foreign companies to move our cargo. And we got our basically ourselves in trouble on the eve of World War I because all of a sudden the British, the Germans, the Italians, the Japanese, and all those co foreign companies that moved our goods disappeared. And then all of a sudden America found itself under problems with getting our imports and exports. Let's be clear. Watch what's happening in Russia right now. Not just government sanctioning, but company sanctionings. What happens when companies sanction against a government? What happens if oil companies sanction the United States and stop moving our goods? What happens if container companies sanction us and stop moving our goods because of an action we're doing? And understand, you don't have to have 100% complete sanction. Just even a few percentage points of capacity can cause massive disruptions across the board. Listen, Again, 100%, DOD should have been cleaning out the Red Hill facility for decades, going in there, doing reports, and fixing the problem. They didn't. I 100% support closing that facility because you are endangering families, dependents, and children. God's sakes, go do this. However, the idea that we're going to use that gobbledygook statement and we're going to use distributed lethality and, and all this other crud to handle this is not a plan. Because right now, you're literally creating the, the reason why we need the Jones Act. Because we need right now at the same time a pool of U.S.-owned, U.S. flag tankers to move crude oil from the United States to Hawaii. And we also need them to preposition fuel because we just lost the major fuel hub in Hawaii. Understand, you can go all the way back to the mainland to go get fuel, but you've doubled the, the transit uh, uh, distance involved. And the very few US Navy oilers we have, 15 Kaiser class, two supply class, and we're building the John Lewis, but the first one hasn't been completed yet. Those ships in the Pacific are going to have to pull double duty because now they're going to have to run all the way back to the West Coast to grab fuel and head back out in case of a contingency, in case of a conflict. They may be able to pull from some storage sites in the Far East, in the Middle East, but in case of a conflict, they would have to go all the way back to the West Coast. And understand, there's been calls for a voluntary tanker agreement to get some uh, more tankers under the U.S. flag. We need to ensure there is a core capability within the U.S. Merchant Marine. This is national security. This is national economy. This is everything. Yes, it's more expensive to use a Jones Act vessel because it's U.S. built, U.S. owned, U.S. flagged. Then do measures to lower those costs, lower tax rates, lower the cost on mariners, reduce their tax burden to make it cheaper for companies to hire them, uh, give them incentives to become US flagged, make cargo preference so you're hauling cargo, make sure there's cargo available to them. What some will argue, just get rid of it. Just, just open it up to the foreign flags, let foreign flags do it, it's worked great, has it? Have they not seen the supply chain crisis that we've been in since 2020? Do they not see companies self-sanctioning against governments they don't like? Listen, we're the US, we're gonna do something somebody doesn't like. What happens when a company sanctions us and removes five, 10, 15, 20% of the carriage capacity that we depend on from our fleet? We're seeing it right now with Russia being sanctioned. We're seeing it with Ukraine being blockaded. What happens when this happen when 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 someone decides to do this to us understand 
this is a complex situation. We need to fix this. What we don't need is Department of Defense gobbledygook and, and, and soup salad coming out and telling us everything's going to be great because nobody understood the statement we just said. <sighs> Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please subscribe. Hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos when they come out. Leave a comment. Give it a thumbs up. Share it across social media. Be sure to share it with Secretary of Defense Austin. I'm sure he'll enjoy my comments about this. And if you can, if you can, become a Patreon, support the page. It allows us to put these videos together to anger everybody in the Department of Defense. Because I, I got to tell you, the, we've been talking about this for such a long time. And everybody knew this was an issue. And yet, once again, we wait until the situation gets out of control to go ahead and fix it. And now we have to play catch up and no punchy paragraph with all the key words that the Department of Defense like to use is going to fix this. Until our next video, Sal, signing off.